Hello, everyone, and welcome to the EVN Disrupt podcast. My name is Nejda Zadurian. I'm the editor of the creative tech section here at EVN Report. This week, we are continuing our series of podcasts from the Science and Technology Convergence Conference. We were happy to be the media partner of the STC conference, which was organized by SmartGate's Catalyst Foundation, with the support of the European Union and the GIZ Foundation. Once again, we have two guests on this week's podcast. Our first guest is Ashot Papoyan, a biotech executive who currently holds the positions of Chief Operating Officer at Biosim, and he's also the CEO of Elm Tree Research. Our second guest is Haik Eskandarian, a microbiologist at the University of California, San Francisco. With our two guests, we spoke about both experimental biology and commercializing science findings in the biotech industry. Thank you for listening. Ashut, let's start with a little bit of your background. Uh, tell us how you got involved in the, the biotech space and what it is you guys are doing at, at Elm Tree and Biosim. Thank you, Nishde, and thank you for ha- having me. Um, so um, a little bit about myself. So I was born and raised in Yerevan, in Armenia, and I did my initial uh, undergrad and master's degree uh, here at uh, Yerevan State University in biophysics, after which I went uh, to complete my PhD at Cornell University in New York and sort of been involved in, a, in a biotech and healthcare ever since. Uh, what was interesting that after finishing a PhD at Cornell, uh, we sort of were initial members of uh, uh, a biotech company that was the spin-off from Cornell University, and we stayed in Ithaca for a few years and then moved to Boston. Mm-hmm. So currently we reside in Boston, and uh, one of the f- sort of first things we did when we, um, my wife and I, when we moved to... Uh, Boston is established an uh, Armenian biotech group in Boston, which sort of started as um, lunch sort of meetings between friends, two, three people that uh, grew to be about 150, 160 people now, wow. from students to CEOs, from scientists to tech people, and we meet on a regular basis, more so before COVID, like yeah. in person during COVID, we did some uh, sort of more online meetings. And the main goal is network, you know, get to know each other, do business together, and then uh, try to be involved in Armenian biotech healthcare space. It's kind of like the biotech version of high tech, which was started in, version of high tech, uh, yes. in the Valley. Yeah. And for those who don't know, Boston is really the global capital of, of biotech companies. It's right? worldwide probably yeah. number one yeah. um, sort of hotspot. What is it about the Boston ecosystem that has turned it into such a competitive space for, for biotech companies and the biotech ecosystem? I think primarily the education system. The universities. The universities there, the Harvard, the MIT, Tufts, and, and more of a history how, how it started. And the state of Massachusetts had uh, sort of back in maybe 60s, 70s, started doing a strong targeted, implementing targeted program to um, advanced biotech. For example, even in our small example, our original biotech company that was found uh, in the state of New York, uh, after we grew just a little bit, the state of Massachusetts actually gave us a, a sizable grant to move the, the whole company to, to Massachusetts. To Massachusetts, to Boston. yeah. Yeah, so uh, they, they have very targeted approach, how, right. how to grow it, and after, after the system sort of uh, becomes, it becomes like a living organism yeah. itself. So they, they did a strong original investment and targeted approach, but, and then the universities picked up, and uh, yeah. now it's considered a number one sort of hotspot, a healthcare biotech hotspot. It really speaks to how important it is to have strategic directions in, in developing your, your local ecosystem, right? And right, if, and if it was done on a state level, right. uh, with, uh, sort of Right, 60, 70 years ago. So the Armenian biotech space is still quite small and, and new, I would say. What are some lessons we can take from Massachusetts to, uh, to develop our local biotech ecosystem here? Again, it needs to be sort of a targeted government approach and to real, real life assessment, uh, the resources we have here, the talent we have here, and then understand what are the needs and what network we have worldwide and how we can leverage that network to bring the biotech space right. here. And for, for biotech, it's perhaps sometimes a little bit more complicated than, than other sub-industries because it involves professionals from various backgrounds 
uh, to develop that ecosystem, right? And in addition to that, so the complexity of the issue, also the, the equipment that is involved in doing biotech and healthcare. I think there's sort of two types of uh, approaches uh, or two types of disciplines there, where there is the computational biology, which is right now what Biosim is specializing in, computational drug design. In that case, your um, investment in equipment is not that much. Yeah. So if you have a good talent here, you have the opportunity to, to move the project forward. But there is experimental biology in addition right. to that. So that's the sort of the majority of the biology and, uh, and the technology there. That one can require a, a strong um, investment. And, right. and in many cases, the equipment is not there. More recently, the more advanced equipment is designed to be used very frequently, like high throughput and things like that. You, you can bring half a million dollar equipment here, yeah. and it's just not, if you're not gonna use it, if you're gonna you use it, it once or twice a year, it's just not worth the investment. So it's a, a little bit chicken and egg problem. Right. So someone needs to step up, perhaps the government or investors, and support it for initial period of time until uh, it sort of becomes a living organism on its own. And is able to sustain itself. Right. So in, in examples like that, it's often government funding or state funding that can really drive that forward, right? Yeah, m most of the time. Most of the time, I think yeah. in, uh, Because that's a long return investment, right. as I said. Like Massachusetts probably started pushing on that maybe in the 60s, and now we're seeing the reward of that. And they are getting their, all their money back and more right. with uh, via taxes and things like that. But initially, they... Uh, smart people, you know, so saw that the future that. would be, yeah. w this would be important for the future. So we're here at the Science and Technology Convergence Conference. And if I'm not mistaken, Biosim, uh, which was co-founded by your brother, Garigin Papoyan, and which you're the chief operating officer of, the idea of it and the sort of initial connections were started at the same conference in 2019, I've heard. It's an interesting story of how Diaspora and Armenia can really collaborate together to build a company like Biosim in Armenia. How you view effective Diaspora-Armenia collaborations and, and what it is that Biosim is doing? Yeah, so as it relates to the Diaspora and, and uh, uh, how to leverage that, right? So I think as, as Armenians, we're good at networking, but we still have ways to go in terms of doing like a productive networking and targeted structural networking. And what... Uh, SmartGate is good at is, is, is really putting sort of meaning and, and targets and deliverables behind, behind all these networking conferences that they're organizing, such yeah. as this one. And exactly what, uh, as you described, so that was the science that Garigin has brought, you know, met here with the resources that the SmartGate brought in and met at the conference. And the Biosim was born and was born about two years ago. Uh, with uh, initial investment from SmartGate. And, uh, and as I said, the Biosim is doing the, the computational drug design. So it's doing the type of biology that doesn't require a lot of initial in investment into equipment. And, and the talent is here. Uh, and as, as you know, the IT space, the technology space is really good in Armenia and the talent pool was available. So the, the evol from the sort of evolutionary standpoint, the way the, the system is going to work. So what Biosim does is, uh, is developing a platform that is doing sort of virtual screen of all the potential molecules can be, that can become medicine. Right. In the conventional drug discovery, uh, all that screen is done real life on a table with uh, expensive equipment and uh, expensive uh, human time, basically. So instead of doing thousands and thousands of experiments and, and trying to figure out that one molecule that has the potential of becoming a medicine, a drug, what Biosim does, it does all this virtual screen, does it with this specific formula and selects that one or two or few molecules. So that really cuts down the time and investment needed to uh, not do those experiments. Right. So as experimentalists, you don't have to do a thousand experiments anymore. You need to do only five. So the time in, the, in this biotech and, and pharma space, time is the most valuable it's thing. It's boosting so productivity and research. Do, you know, thousands of experiments is gonna take me years, it's gonna cost me a lot of um, investment. Yeah. 
So this is the and, and Biosiv now has developed sort of world's best and most accurate and the fastest the screening technology yeah. that is going to advance the the drug discovery field. Can you tell us a little bit about where if they if you guys have raised another funding round or if you um, are really just focused right now on building more of your market and attracting clients? Customers? So right now we are at the uh, research and development stage. We just finished a successful round, and so we have the necessary resources to finish the development of the product. As I said, the, the, the product is brand new, so it, it's, it's going to require some validation experiments. So uh, I'm hoping that we can bring together the biologists from Armenia in Armenia to do the experimental part as well. So the computational part, that part that is being done with the use of computers is almost complete. So our next stage is to take these molecules that the Biosim platform is going to recommend or is going to figure out from this list of thousands of molecules and take it to the experimental lab and, and try actually to test it, that these, these molecules are working as intended. Right. And that's a very long and expensive process. Right. So we're hoping to do part of it in Ar Armenia as well, and that will become a spark again to... Right to advance, to help the, develop the experimental biology ecosystem right. as well. And then is the vision to then partner up with pharmaceutical companies to actually develop the drug? Once the, the platform is ready, there are two ways to go, which are not mutually exclusive. Uh, one is a company can buy the software and run their own screens, or they can partner with us and we can do the screens for them yeah. and co-develop the the future molecule or the future drug, or we do our own screens and then we find molecules that we are interested in that we see the potential of becoming a drug. So, which uh, would be produced by Biosim? Maybe? Which would be, it's it's a very very long process. Right. To um, it's not realistic to think that we will be the producers or manufacturers of a drug that will be on the shelf. Right. Those, that's a very a different Herculean task that yeah. is being done by large pharma and things like that. So if when we get to that stage, we're going to partner with someone else yeah. um, to, to, do to do the that manufacturing the, and uh, yeah. FDA approvals and things like yeah. that. In terms of diaspora Armenia effective collaborations, you're someone who was born in Armenia, um, you studied here, and then you spent most of your career uh, in the U.S., it sounds like. What's your message to diasporans who might be listening, who are also in, in fields like biotech or other cutting-edge fields who want to get involved in Armenia? What, how should they approach it? What's the best way to get started? That's an interesting question. I think the message should be more towards the uh, uh, Armenians from Armenia because the diaspora Armenians, they're, they're moving their careers forward and their uh, lives forward as is. And it is not realistic to expect that most of the diaspora Armenians will become involved like Garagin and I are right. because we have the connection and things like that. So my I think the message would go more towards the Armenians from Armenia that try to seek out the connections right. that you need and do your homework when you are when you are doing this, this networking and understand exactly, be very specific of what you need. So many times I would receive these messages say, can you help us in and be very general? And then, like, I have no idea. I need to do a lot of homework myself to understand but the what they is, need. Yeah. And usually, I just don't have the time to do it and things like that. So I, I, I think overall, my, my experience has been that the diaspora Armenians are there uh, to participate, to support, to make businesses here and things like that. But they need someone, they need drivers here. They need someone to really take the sort of take the wheel and do it. In that case, they will find partners there. Right. Yeah. Uh, to to expect that it's the other way around, like, oh, these guys from the US are gonna come and fix the problems here. It's, it's just, not realistic. It's, it's, it's not yeah. realistic. I think we don't know even with the, our involvement, like Garagin and I, which are is more than most, we don't know the details of the issues on the ground, the needs on the ground. But if someone comes with a very specific question and very specific request, most of the times we can be 
of help yeah. one way or another. It's also more effective, I think, because often diasporans don't know where to start. Um, so if people working on important things in, in Armenia are the ones to take the first step and take the initiative to reach out to people in the diaspora who can really be helpful to them, I think is much more impactful, actually. Yeah, yeah. and the efficiency is going to be yeah. there. And it's a good way to think about it. Yeah. yeah. Before we wrap up, uh, I want to hear about what you guys are doing at Elm Tree. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your the products you guys are working on and the research directions you're taking? Elm Tree Research, I co-founded with my business partner, Dr. Zorar Manukian, uh, who is also Armenian and uh, also from, from Armenia, but now lives in Boston. So again, one of the sort of outcomes of the Armenian biotech group, sort of networking yeah. events and things like that. What Elm Tree Research does, we specialize in finding sort of cutting edge treatment and for, for monitoring of mental health and addiction. Okay. So starting from the, my previous company, I have always been interested um, in sort of developing the next generation painkillers, which would be non-addictive. As you probably know, addiction issue is, is very big in the US. Opioids, like and, opioids yeah. and things like only in last year, there were more than 100,000 deaths yeah. of, from the overdose. Uh, so I've been involved, uh, sort of at the beginning, I've been involved in the, on a molecular level, how to find what medicines to find that will do the job of being a painkiller but not addictive. So that sort of got me interested in, in that field. And when we were sort of discussing how to, you know, what can be done and things like that, we understood that one of the problems is when a patient comes from to treatment to treatment, it could be a week or, or a month in between those two visits. And uh, it's not really clear what happens in between. Mm -hmm. So we, we thought we, we could be with a wearable device, we could develop a technology that will uh, read biomarkers, basically, a person's uh, breathing rate, temperature, and all other there are varieties of biomarkers. And when we combine all those together, we can sort of perhaps understand if the person has taken too, uh, much. Well, yeah. or too much and, and things like that. Right. So that was the original idea and that we... We, d we founded the company Elm Tree Research. We also have uh, clinics there, which are called Elm Tree Clinics, which are real clinics with uh, real patients coming in. So we have the advantage of having access to the patients and patient data yeah. and understand the effectiveness of, of the tools that are being developed. Yeah. Regarding the wearables, is it um, like popular wearables like Apple Watch and stuff or wearables that you guys yourselves have manufactured? No, this is going to be in integrated in one of the so commercial ones. So it's a software ones, solution, yeah. right, yeah. yeah. One of the most interesting takeaways I've had over these last two days doing podcasts here at the Science and Technology Convergence Conference is how effective sort of diaspora networking groups can be. Um, you know, it, it sounds like the, the biotech group in Boston uh, spun off at least a couple of companies. Uh, high tech has been just super successful in the Valley and bridging uh, Armenia with them. It sort of brings to mind, you know, why can't Armenians in finance in New York or uh, other industries, you know, create similar groups and try to have similar impact through their networking for Armenia? Um, so I, I think if, if we have listeners listening in from other industries, they should really consider placing those efforts and finding, you know, local Armenians in, in similar industries and, and working together on it. I would say the, the, the sort of the key is finding uh, folks who would lead that effort, Yeah, who would... It's like we were talking originally about doing the original investment and then you get the rewards right. later, right? So right. someone would need to invest the original time yeah. and organize it and be rejected yeah, and yeah. be said, no, I can't come many times until it becomes the original crystallization yeah. point and then it will be productive. And self-sustainable. Something, something of that sort happened in Boston when we were creating the Armenian Biotech Group. I'm not sure what was the history of the high tech, but I'm sure there was one or two or a team of people that led the effort, and now we are all sort of, sort of harvesting the yeah. results of that. Yes. Yeah. So I think in finance, whether it's in New York, it just you, there needs to be this development of this Group. original yeah. volunteer effort to do it, and then once it happens everyone is going to like it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Ashut, my last question. Uh, what do you hope to see for the Armenian uh, biotech ecosystem in the next 10 years? What are some things we, should, we need to be focusing on to get there? I think, you know, I want to see it develop like the IT sector has developed. And I, but I want to be realistic that, you know, uh, the 
it takes more time, more investment to do it, and it takes time to develop entire field. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we're going to see this computational biology develop, be the drug, the drug discovery part or the bioinformatics, DNA sequence analysis, and things like that. Things that will, can be done with knowledge and a computer, basically. Mm -hmm. And, but that would lead to offshoots of experimental biology. And I know there are labs that are being developed and things like that. And then we'll, a better understanding what, uh, how we can take advantage of you know, our geography, which in many cases is unfortunate, but also you know, what we can do, how can we become a regional center that can you know, support Iran, service very the region. large. Yeah. large country and service the, the so th that sort of thing so right. it will go computational and then if we're successful on that part it will go into experimental biology which is the heavy right. heavy part of biology yeah. okay Asha, this was a fascinating conversation i personally learned a lot from it so thank you so much for joining us and i i hope we'll have a chance to talk about this again in the future all right thank you thank, thank you, you Asha. Inviting me. My guest is Haik Eskandagan, a microbiologist from the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, Haik, thank you so much for joining us here oh, today. Pleasure. Over the last two days, we've been here at the Science and uh, Technology Convergence Conference, and we've been speaking to a lot of people from industry and in the biotech industry. Um, and you're from the academia side. You're the bio part of the biotech. So I want to speak with you about that today. But let's first start off with a little bit of your background. Tell us what it is you do and what are your research interests? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a microbiologist and I study infection biology, actually. So I uh, come from the United States, but I'm a French Armenian. Cool. And I did my PhD in, in France, in Paris, at uh, the Pasteur Institute, um, which is really focused on understanding how and why bacteria behave the way they do. Um, particularly in the context of infection. Uh, after doing my PhD in Paris, I moved to Lausanne in Switzerland, where I worked in an engineering school, which builds tools for then utilizing them in, in biology. And, and there I was really seduced to do a postdoc, um, trying to understand how and why bacteria can tolerate stresses to which they're genetically sensitive. Um, and so we build tools to drive discovery of new ways in which bacteria live, emerge, adapt, and die, um, which is rather exciting. It's rather new. It's uh, really going back to first principles and offers us uh, new perspectives on, mm -hmm. in biology. Yeah. What are some trends in, in academia and biology that we should all be aware of? That's a very interesting question. So I would say that... Um, I'll take a step back and I'll say that I am a doctor of philosophy. We're not doctors of science. And what that means is that we use science to drive an understanding of how our, our world exists. Mm -hmm. um, so that's to say that um, new technologies that we bring to, um, to biology allow us to understand uh, how this world works and how organisms exist in new ways. So new trends. Well, I think that um, one very important trend is um, the, the invasion or the reinvasion of physicists and quantitative uh, minded people into the biology field again. And what that means is that, for example, we are able to develop tools that uh, allow us to study biology in ways that we couldn't previously. So part of that is, for example, building advanced microscopes, yeah. um, where, for example, the work I do uh, focuses on not seeing uh, a cell, but touching and feeling a cell. What does that mean? That means yeah. that we, so microscopes, optical microscopes, have existed for 400 years. Right. And we, we, we can see things and, and perceive cells in various ways. But what we have the capability of doing now is developing microscopes that touch surfaces of okay. bacteria, for example, which are the organisms I study. And, try, and that allows us to, to see features and feel and understand how bacteria exist in ways that we previously couldn't. Mm -hmm. That allows us to, for example, understand why a bacterium divides the way it does. Mm -hmm. And this question of why certain processes happen, I think, is critical. A critical aspect in biology that yeah. is under 
appreciated and for which disruptive engineering based techniques are really necessary to drive forward. Yeah. We've been having these conversations with scientists like yourself over yeah. the last couple of days, and it's just incredible to hear how much of science has really become interdisciplinary. Oh, so yes. now you're talking about physicists and people from the field of optics driving innovation in, in biology. Absolutely. And earlier we were hearing about it in different perspectives. Where, the bio, where academic biology fits into the greater biotech ecosystem, that's a mm. part that I really want to understand. So there's computational biology, which are computer scientists and bioinformaticians um, taking data and uh, working with it to solve problems. Um, but often that data has to come from a lab or has to be validated in a lab. Speak a little bit about how the wet labs play their role in the ecosystem. Well, let me tell you why academics exist in the first place, right. perhaps, which is to say that um, biologists in academia try to understand why uh, systems exist the way they do. Why, why do bacteria behave the way they do? Why mm -hmm. do um, diseases emerge? All of those discoveries form the basis for then how to then create solutions yeah. in the biotech field. One way to refine the way a solution can be developed in the biotech field is by doing other sorts of experiments, which are not fundamental experiments, but translational experiments, right. which take an idea which has been established and discovered in, in fundamental research and then translating those into um, uh, tractable solutions that can then be developed into products which can be commercialized. Right. So if I'm understanding correctly, um, biology, academic mm -hmm. biology, mm -hmm. often sets the direction that biotech companies and people working in biotech take. Yes. And then they sort of reverse engineer the, mm -hmm. the solution from the problem that is defined by you guys. Yeah. So yeah, we establish the bounds of how life exists right. and, and why it does. And that offers a perspective on what we can actually do mm -hmm. uh, later on. So you're at the University of California, San Francisco. That's correct. Um, yeah. Which is in San Francisco, the sort of the global capital of technology. Have you seen more and more university industry collaborations over the last, let's say, five, seven, ten years, specifically in biotech? I have seen a lot more collaborations emerging, not only in San Francisco, not only in the Bay Area, um, but also in other hubs like Boston. I would say right. that Boston is really the mecca and San Francisco is the Medina <laughs> of, of that sort of right. relationship between academia and private industry. But I would say that, um, in fact, even UCSF is very, very slow to translate discoveries into uh, solutions right. in, in, the private, in private industry. And that's partially at the institutional or the the lack of institutional drive to drive translation forward. Mm. Now, that being said, what I think is really exciting about, for example, a place like Armenia is that you don't have any of those institutions necessarily that could hold you back. So we can establish something new right from the start where we take academia and we take private industry and we, we create those interactions right from right. the start. What are the institutions that hold you back in the U.S.? We have tech transfer offices, which, mm. are, which are quite small, which are also not very imaginative per se. So they see, for example, a market for what it is. For example, I could say, you want to develop an antibiotic. And so they'll say, well, there's no money in that. Right. Uh, so why would you want to do that? It, right. uh, it's not viable. But if we say that we can develop not just one antibiotic, but thousands of antibiotics, and disrupt even the definition of what an antibiotic is in the first place, I think that that's very exciting and powerful. Yeah. That all depends on whether the institution actually understands that in mm -hmm. the first place. Uh, that requires scientists in a tech transfer office that are imaginative people, and we don't quite have that yet. Mm -hmm. So because Armenia is kind of a still somewhat of a blank slate, we can avoid some of those, those mistakes that have been made in the U.S. And other I think places. so. Yeah. And I think that we're also, we are a global nation, and so we can really take advantage of exceptional people around the world. That is our true Leverage wealth. Leverage that resource. Yeah. yeah, that is our true wealth. I mean, yes, our wealth is as well in our land here. Right. But I think even more so, it's in our network, our right. unique, our yeah. uniqueness, our yeah. Armenianness, <laughs> as it were. Right. 
So what is the current state of um, academic biology in Armenia? Um, give us sort of an, an overview of where we are. Do we have a lot of wet labs that are operating in the universities, or what do we need to work on? So we have, we have academic research here in Armenia, but not as much in universities as in uh, institutes which are, which are governed by the National Academy of Sciences here. The way in which the National Academy of Sciences has worked for many years has been based on how the Soviet system yeah. worked, um, which is to say that funding comes from the state, goes to the institutes, the institutes will, um, will distribute that cash among each of the labs. Um, the way research works in the Occidental world is grant-driven. You apply for competitively right. for grants, and that enables you to do research. If you don't get grants, the lab closes down. It's, it couldn't be scary. But that's the reality of life, or the reality of the system. And we need to impress that upon Armenians in Armenia. We need to develop as well institutions that allow for researchers here to apply for grants in a competitive Globally. way, to offer them the ability uh, to write grants uh, in a competitive way. So right. grantsmanship is important. It's a way of thinking, but all of that is solvable, right. inevitably. It's a question of culture. It's a question of understanding. Practices within Absolutely. the ecosystem. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have wet labs right now in Armenia that can support a biotech ecosystem? Can they take some of those findings and validate them with, through the experiments? So I think that one tractable area of biology is in fact computational biology, which melds physicists, right. mathematicians, statisticians with biologists and biological problems for which a lot of big data is available in many instances and for which big data can be generated rather uh, quickly here yeah. or elsewhere. So we're here today at the Science and Technology Convergence Conference, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of professionals from both the diaspora and locally here in Yegaban. Is there anything you're seeing, any effective and efficient collaboration models for scientists like yourself from abroad to be working with local institutions? I think that the real excitement of this sort of conference is really to offer, for example, me as an academic scientist, the opportunity to meet people that would help me translate right. uh, discoveries into biotech companies right. in the future, um, where I meet not only venture capitalists or MBAs who actually yeah. know how to run a business, um, but also uh, people that could work, scientists sure. or engineers who could work in that sort of company. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's uh, the rather excitement of this sort of uh, conference. conference. Yeah. That I would never go to this sort of conference abroad. There's no uh, reason for me to do so as an academic. But here in Armenia, all of a sudden, right. uh, it happens. Right. That's, that's yeah. rather, I think that there's magic there. Right. Is there maybe some uh, entrepreneurial paths in your future that uh, we can look yeah, out for? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You'll have to promise to come back when the, the startup With launches and, and talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us today, Hank. Thank you. Pleasure.